This is Agriculture Today. I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. Ahead of us on this Friday's program, we have our grain market update provided by K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. He discusses high demand for grain across the board right now as buyers compete for supplies and the bullish export markets for wheat with the USDA finally releasing a current export update. Also ahead, we have Guy Allen, our senior economist with the International Grains Program here at K-State, breaks down the September WASDE report. We round out today's program with this week's agricultural weather report, which is provided by K-State meteorologist Chip Redman. He shares that recent rain has not been as impactful as hoped and warns that wildfire risks will increase as we experience greater wind speeds in the coming weeks. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are back now with Dan O'Brien. He is our K-State grain market economist. And as always, he's joining us for our weekly grain market update. So, Dan, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Samantha. Absolutely. So it's been a busy week this past week. We've got a lot we're going to cover, especially in terms of obviously here in the U.S., but big shifts in the grain basis because of that. Yes. You know, we started the week with that USDA crop production WASDE report, and there were surprises in that. Generally, a uh, corn production number uh, that came in with a yield of 172.5 bushels per acre and a below 14 billion bushel crop. And that just, if anything, exacerbated, made more frontal the drought issues that we've had here in the Western Corn Belt and made all that much more uh, stressful the tightness that, that we're seeing in, on in supply demand and led to high, strong basis levels, especially for corn out here in the West. Just quite the situation, you know, in our in our reports that you and I talk about all on, on these weeks, you know, we look at the futures price trends and, and across the these commodities uh, for corn, uh, these corn futures, November soybean futures, even for wheat, we have at least moderate, if not strong strong uptrends on the futures, much less what's happening on the basis side. So uh, quite the situation. If you want me to go into it, I'll, I'll take a look at, let's take a look at corn, corn based in particular. That's, that's really the thing we're most attuned to. As of closes on Thursday, the 15th of September, we had a basis of $1.36 over these futures in Garden City. Of course, that's a demand center for uh, livestock feeding, uh, some ethanol plants down in there uh, at times when you have excess grain ec- and export source as well, but especially livestock feeding going on. So $1.36 in Hutchinson, a dollar and one cent over, 90 cents over in Salina, 90 in Colby, 81, 81 over in Columbus. So strong basis levels. And uh, you know, we've had public meetings, talked with people uh, in conversations. The bids we're seeing here are the grain elevator bids. And with some, when we get to new crop bids on, if you look at our information, there's some ethanol plant bids for next year that come in. What really is, uh, I guess, attention grabbing are some of the the bids we don't normally follow, the bids at livestock feeders, at some um, some pork feeders out here in the western part of the state, reported numbers of bids from cattle feedlots that, that are at this 136 or much stronger even. Those bids are aimed at probably trying to get in front of supply questions about bringing grain in from the from the eastern and central corn belt. So we have reports of, of uh, train, train loads uh, committed or coming or been here of, of corn out of those areas and uh, and uh, have even had reports from the cent- eastern and central corn belt about and talked with my colleagues there wondering how, well how come how come their base is so strong well the answer to the question is that hey we, we're coming to buy your corn because <laughs> we're short we really mm-hmm. are short one other point to bring up you know a long time strong basis area of this western corn belt been down at around Hereford, Texas, Friona, some of those communities, and they just start out with the presumption that they're short corn, you know, that they've got to bring stuff in. So those bids have been pretty strong train bids, is my understanding. Well, now, as we've looked at at, uh, our bids here in western Kansas relative to that area that's been a grain bid leader in the western corn belt for for a good number of years now our bids are essentially equal with theirs so that that's indicating with our drought that we've had here we are deficit the way i would think this could unfold is is that you know we do have some corn we've had on thankfully we have uh, not every place is a terrible shape 
We have some dry land corn, although a lot of it's very, very damaged, or some of it's abandoned. On, on the irrigated side, we've had some success. We hear the, the heat that came in July affected that, too. But we will have corn coming in at harvest, and whatever is loose for sale, that'll be brought in. You know, that'll help the situation for sure. Uh, my concern would be, uh, again, once those supplies are used up for, with cattle or hogs, then we'll be reliant especially on, on imported grain. And we always bring in grain to some degree in this area, but there'll be a real uh, strong motivation to bring all that much more in. So I, I guess if someone asks, what's, what's the impact of the drought of uh, 2022 upon us? Well, it's, it's left us really deficit in terms of supplies for grain, and we've seen that express itself in very, very strong basis levels, especially for corn, and uh, it's really set us up for a, a time of real, uh, I guess you could call it scrambling for supplies to just to keep these enterprises going out here in the West as we move not through just the, these first four, five, six months of, of this marketing. You're starting September 1. My concern is on the backside of that. How do we keep these enterprises going? Uh, and uh, what profitability will livestock feeders have given high priced corn that they've got to got to work with so again we'll be thankful for the supplies that come up front from what we harvest but what what happens on the backside that's that's where my concerns lie absolutely yeah and i know you've put together some estimates and probabilities of different price outcomes that we might be seeing so let's go ahead and talk about those while we're thinking future wise what we might be seeing you know, my office is actually in western Kansas, and there's a bias, a, they call it a confirmation bias, to where you tend to see information that agrees with your presumption. I look out my window, and it's pretty dry. We have had ha, haven't had great crops, so my perspective on where the corn market's going is probably affected by that. I'm, in terms of prices, uh, pretty optimistic for where prices could go. I, I think we'll hold up strong until we get some evidence out in 2023 that we're going to have a drought again. Sure. You know, so let's say that the uh, USDA is right and probably 50, 60 percent chance that, that they're correct in what they have. This is on uh, based on updated September numbers. And then from from there, th- their projection was uh, for the USDA at 675. I think I've, I've got projections at 690. And then if, if things get even tighter later on, if the USDA comes in in the October report or the November report and shaves even more off that that production number, then boy, we get tight. And then we're seven dollars or above and it's just a matter of what what we have to bid to get get supplies in absolutely yeah obviously corn not the only market that's been having really strong prices here lately soybeans another market that we're obviously worried about what crop wise we're going to actually have come out but harvest coming up soon for that as well harvest coming up for soybeans again that's not so much a western kansas issue although we certainly have bids in, at major markets colby and garden city etc uh, in kansas uh, the dry dry weather has likely affected us some in uh, central part of the state Generally, that out, coming out of that USDA report, there was a cutback in overall production, I think down to 50.5, 50.4 bushels per acre. Uh, and that was a surprise to the market. There was an expectation that, hey, it's 51.5, 51.9, no problem. Well, the dry conditions even affect parts of the eastern central Corn Belt. Uh, you see cash prices now for soybeans. Really, quite a lot of variability. It's surprising when you look across the state uh, at Topeka, Hutchinson, Columbus, those eastern locations, you're over $15 for cash bids. And you look twice to wonder if that's right. Again, a, a positive basis for soybeans of 81 cents in Topeka, Hutchinson 50 over in the Columbus area, one location of 1566 of $1.15 over. Amazing strength. And in looking at basis bids for soybeans, corn's jumped up really strong basis and again we rolled contracts and things that's affected that some but jumped up came back down a little bit and now it's trending higher in some of these locations on, on soybeans uh, where you really see the jumps happening again topeka hutchinson columbus uh, just a, a lot of strength and, and not just oh a slight trend up just a shot up really strong basis levels so when i see things like that you've got to wonder about export demand or uh, being near a plant Plants worried about getting supplies. and So those type of really, really volatile movements are just uh, endemic of the type of year we have where you know, we've had this drought in parts of the country and we're anticipating short supplies and buyers are scrambling to get hold of what supplies of these crops that they can. So we've wrapped up soybeans and corn, our discussion here today, but let's get into wheat. We've got some really bullish and strong market export reports specifically here. 
Yeah, uh, even though yesterday the futures were just so-so for hard red winter wheat down 23 cents, actually the numbers that came out on, on exports for the week ending September 8th, by the way, that USDA numbers finally have come out after a glitch they had in their system. They were, weren't available for four weeks. Well, they came out for the September 8th figures, and that was on yesterday morning, and showed that for the week ending, the, again, September 8th, we had 24, almost 25 million bushels of all wheat in the U.S. exported, and we need about 16 and a half to meet the USDA's projections. So we haven't seen that for a good long time. Hard red, what we grow, we had a, a exports of about 7.2 million bushels, need a, a pace of about 4.8, 4.9 to beat the USDA's projections. For hard red spring, 12 million bushels it, uh, exported actually shipped in that week, we need about 4.6 meet the USA's projections. So that happened in spite of the high U.S. dollar. So there must be buyers uh, across the world looking to get hold of what grain they can. And we had a particularly good week in, in the wheat market. And as we talked about, you know, the wheat futures, which tend to be so flat during this time frame, they're actually trending up. So uh, I guess it makes our friends in the wheat market, uh, in the wheat industry, happy to see that. But the question in front of us is acreage. What, what are we going to plant? We're about to, at the end of the production cycle for corn, sorghum, and uh, soybeans, sunflowers, cotton, etc. We're just starting over for wheat and uh, starting in a dry situation. So we'll see what happens. At last, last comment I'd say on wheat is that if we maintain high crop insurance prices, that will not be a deterrent to people planting wheat as they look to manage cash flows and protect them, protect their farm income in the coming years. So even though we're dry, we'll see if uh, the high insurance prices tend to encourage planting of hard red winter wheat anyway. Dan, thank you so much for your insight. As always, you provide so much valuable information for our listeners, and we really do appreciate it. Well, thank you, Samantha. I look forward to, to helping out. Once again, that was Dan O'Brien. He is our grain market economist here at K-State, sharing with us information for our weekly grain market update. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. is agriculture today we are back now with guy allen he is a senior economist from k-state's international grains program and he's joining us for our monthly WASDE report so a summary of all the august numbers that we saw internationally so guy thanks for joining us good to be here again today samantha Absolutely. Well, we're happy to have you. Like I mentioned, you add such value to the program in terms of understanding internationally what our exports and imports are looking like. So let's start, though, with information from the U.S. This Monday, the Fed announced the monthly inflation numbers. It's kind of tumultuous what we're seeing. (laughs) Yeah, Monday's numbers for uh, inflation were quite a bit higher than the market had expected. Uh, They came in at 8.3 percent across the board, which uh, increasingly commentators are suggesting that this recession could be an inflation environment could be a bit longer lived than what we had originally expected. And as long as the federal government continues to spend large chunks of money, I just think it's going to be very hard for the Federal Reserve to get on top of that. But just for a moment, let's break down some of the pieces of that. While 8.3 was sort of an interesting number, I think some of the components of that were uh, probably more interesting. Looking at the food component of that, food came in at 11.4 percent, which I don't think is any surprise to anybody that goes to the grocery store fairly regularly. The other interesting component is gasoline and energy. Gasoline came in at 25.6. The energy complex came in at 23.8. And uh, even though we've seen gasoline prices at the pump come off a bit here recently, it's still year on year a significant rise. And that flow of the cost of energy uh, goes across the whole economy uh, fairly rapidly in in everything we do from transport to manufacturing and and production. I think we're all feeling, obviously, the effects of this, whether it's grocery store shopping or if you're like me and you just booked a flight home for the holidays. Those numbers definitely can make you kind of scoff a little bit. (laughs) Yes, I think you and I are both traveling a bit more now here post-COVID. And uh, just an interesting note on airline fares, they're up uh, 33.4%, so more than a third uh, year on year, which I think you and I have both realized that in the last uh, couple weeks. And getting into the international side of things with what this WASI report really showed, we've had a big impact in the soybean markets. Post-report market reaction was probably more in the soybean oilseed complex. WASDE's uh, cut global ending stocks at 2.5 million metric tons to 98.9 million metric tons for the end of this coming marketing year. It's still 11.7 million metric tons more than what we saw last year, but it's still a very, very tight number. Some of the interesting components on that, we have seen 
seen a significant change in exports coming out of South America, particularly Argentina. And just to drill down a bit deeper in that, a couple weeks ago, the Argentine government announced a special exchange rate for uh, soybean producers in Argentina. If they sold their soybeans, their exchange rate, I believe, was 20 points better than uh, the market exchange rate, which prompted the uh, significant selling of uh, soybean stocks by by the Argentine growers. Keep in mind, in Argentina, you have a hyperinflation situation there. Currency continues to decline at a, a rapid rate. And farmers and producers in Argentina hold their inventory, whether that's soybeans, wheat, corn, livestock, as a hedge against inflation, and particularly match their selling up to the purchase of inputs. But this particular uh, situation with the foreign exchange rate advantage We saw Argentine producers sell 15% of their annual production in a week on their soybeans. So as a result of that, we're seeing uh, exports shift back down to South America for a bit longer. Absolutely. Yeah, strong incentive there. And then in China, soybean imports are actually going down. Yeah, USDA uh, dropped the import forecasts for China uh, by a million metric tons to 97 million. We've been trying to get over that 100 million metric ton mark for the last few years, but just haven't been able to do that in the wake of the uh, swine fever situation and just reduction in demand. So I think uh, having less imports in China is something we're going to look at, and I think that's a reflection a bit of demand destruction on that. We're also seeing a uh, reduction in expected vegetable oil and meal imports into uh, to China there as well. China's kind of experiencing a strange weather scenario right now. They're in the midst of what you're calling a 60-year drought. Very much dry weather across China, and um, they're the biggest importer of oil seeds, but they're also the second largest producer of corn and the largest producer of wheat. And when you're having a 60-year drought, it's uh, going to have an impact on their domestic production. That said, the USDA did come out and forecast China to have a, a fairly significant corn crop this coming season. With a record yield, China's expected to produce about 274 million metric tons of corn. Now, I'm a bit skeptical of that number. Thing to keep in mind, the drought situation in China is in southern China. Most of the corn is produced in central and northern China. There's about 75, 80 million metric tons of corn that moves from northern China to southern China each year. Half of it moves by rail, half of it moves by water coming out of the northern port in Dalian and then coming back into the country in the southern ports around Shenzhen and, and those areas. But I can't help but think with those trade patterns and logistical constraints, China may be buying more corn than we expect. But I think that number may be a bit overstated, and I think their import potential is a bit understated. So the question here of whether or not they're going to put those resources from the northern portion where they have good growing conditions of China itself, or if they're going to import from either us or Brazil potentially? Yeah, either us or Brazil. And that impacts not only soybeans, but corn, and I'll sort of move to the the corn situation here Mm -hmm. as we talk about China. China's imports for corn are expected to be about 23 million metric tons, and uh, I'm a bit more optimistic that that number is going to be north of 25. And then in the grand scheme of global corn production, what are those numbers currently looking like? Corn was a little less of a concern for the market. Uh, World coarse grains, the USDA did lower the ending stocks, or sorry, the beginning stocks for this year, which were the ending stocks for last year, down 2 million metric tons, which is a little bit tighter. However, they have increased the world corn stocks slightly by about 250 thousand metric tons. So it was the other grains other than corn, such as uh, grain, sorghum, barley, etc., which have been tightening up. No surprise given these higher prices that we've seen across the whole coarse grains complex. And then moving on to more news on wheat. I understand world wheat production numbers have increased, the estimation has. Yeah, world production for wheat uh, was came in at just under 784 million metric tons. That was 4.3 million metric tons higher than last month and slightly above last year's record crop of 780 million metric tons. So people are feeling a bit more comfortable on the wheat situation. That was led by a record forecast for uh, Russian wheat production at 91 million metric tons, which is up 3 million metric tons from uh, last year. Also in that same vein, uh, Ukrainian production was up 1 million metric tons to 20.5. 
5 million metric tons, higher than last month, down from last year's situation, but still a, a better number than anticipated by the marketplace. The other number in wheat that sort of surprised me a bit was USDA left the EU crop production unchanged at 132 million metric tons. Just talking about the weather across the EU, we've been having a fairly significant drought, particularly across France and Germany, which are their major producing areas. And we'll sort of see as those harvest numbers become finalized here exactly what that is, but I think that number may be a little bit optimistic. On the flip side of that, we've seen uh, Canada's uh, number unchanged at 35 million metric tons as they recover from last year's drought. Australia is having another near-record crop of 33 million metric tons. That might be a little light. Argentine's wheat crop left unchanged at just under 20 million metric tons. India, who's the second largest wheat producer in in the world, they're forecast at 103 million metric tons was steady, although it's 6.6 million metric tons less than last year. India continues to tighten up on uh, limiting their exports and particularly putting limits on export of flour out of that country there as well as they try to contain uh, food inflation and food security as they go forward. We've talked a lot about weather and we've talked about the optimism of wheat growing in both Russia and Ukraine, but also in terms of those markets, supply chain issues, of course, with the ongoing situation there. Yeah, look, supply chains continue to be a bit tenuous, particularly coming out of the Black Sea. We saw a bit of pushback uh, last week from Putin, a bit frustrated that he opened that market up, but he doesn't feel the wheat is going to those countries that need it the most. I'd suggest the market's allocating it to its highest and best use. So we could see changes in that pretty quickly. So we just keep a very, very close ear to the ground on that. Related to that as well, we have seen in the last couple of weeks a fairly significant rally in the uh, bulk dry freight index. We've seen that rally from about 1,100 points to uh, close to 1,600 points at the end of uh, this week. And we're seeing good strength there. I think that strength is being brought on by iron ore and coal, which makes up nearly two-thirds of that that dry bulk commodity volume. On that coal is at a record price at the benchmark Newcastle, Australia port. FOB values were over $450 a metric ton for coal. Generally, those prices range between $75 to $135 a metric ton. So to see that rally in the last couple months up to four hundred over $450 a ton is significant. Absolutely. Yeah. And some of the demand driving that coming out of Asia, right? Yeah. The big destination for that market particularly is China, number one, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, those sort of markets, you know, that big manufacturing. So we're seeing good, strong demand as they uh, need to fuel their electrical generation in that area, which is, I'd say, is sort of signaling a uh, recovery in the manufacturing industrial complex. It's good to see a bright note in there amongst all the bad news. Absolutely. Well, Guy, we covered a lot today, but as always, the notes that you have compiled for this can be found on Ag Manager, correct? Yeah, available on Ag Manager uh, probably once a fortnight. It's a fairly eclectic collection of comments and articles across the marketplace, which are fairly significant drivers. We will link those in the show notes of today's program, as we always do, which can be found on agtoday.net. But Guy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Samantha. Absolutely. Once again, that was Guy Allen. He is the senior economist from K-State's International Grains Program, providing our monthly update for the WASD report for September. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are back now for our weekly agricultural weather report. And as always, to cover it this week, we have with us Chip Redman. He is our K-State meteorologist. So, Chip, thanks for joining us. Yep, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, we've got some positive news to start with. We had some rain last weekend here in the northeastern region of Kansas. So, I know that it wasn't a lot of rain, but it was, you know, welcome instead of nothing. Yeah, we had over an inch in places, and the numbers sound really impressive and it was a really beautiful rain and it was nice slow rain nice thunder but you know going out two days three days later and looking at the ground and it had very little impact it was really unfortunate that the ground is just so dry that it soaked that all up and then we added you know warmer temperatures and some increased wind and, and that moisture just disappeared instantly point where You know, even when we look at the drought monitor this week, we really didn't see any change in the northeast. We have abnormally dry conditions still persisting, despite that area only averages about three-quarters of an inch a week at this time of the year. So that was above normal precipitation for that area last week. It's just so dry. And we also had rainfall 
in the western part of the state. And once again, kind of classic from the west, really spotty, really isolated amounts. And uh, it's great because it helped settle the dust some, but similar to what we saw in the northeast, it's the impacts are going to be extremely short and a prolonged drought is going to continue. Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned the impacts being short in terms of how it's affected our soil conditions, but even the drought monitor from over that inch of rain that we saw in one day here in the Northeast, it didn't change it at all, right? No, it didn't. Unfortunately, it kept all the Northeast is still at normally dry condition. Hopefully this moisture is enough for folks. I know that especially the Northwest is starting to put in wheat or dust in wheat. And any moisture is good. We just need to keep continued moisture chances every week to to keep that wheat alive long term. Absolutely. And as we're thinking about that, the forecast for the next week or so, do we have any moisture coming in that we should expect? Well, there is a chance of moisture uh, late next week, but you know how that goes when it's a week out. What's really concerning is the forecast for this weekend into early next week. We're getting out of our climatological minimum winds. So typically July and August are really light winds, mainly because we don't get cold fronts through. We don't get strong pressure gradients across the state. And so that's great and and really helped prevent a worse scenario this summer with the the drought as well as dust and and water demand. Unfortunately, as we get into fall, our average winds are increasing. And we're going to see that starting, well, today. (laughs) And, uh, the, the winds have been picking up throughout the week, and we're going to see wind gusting 35, 40 miles an hour through the weekend into early next week. But we're also going to combine that with mostly sunny skies, temperatures 90 to 100 degrees, which is at near record levels for this time of year, and he, really dry conditions. So humidity's 15 to 20 percent, and that is just a recipe to really dry out to what moisture there is. We're seeing that with crops too, where crops are they're drying out really fast to the point where their window um, for silage and whatnot has gotten really narrow because they need that high moisture. And it's just drying out so quick they can't silage it fast enough. So we're really going to have a bad scenario, I think, this weekend and early next week. We'll probably see a lot of blowing dust uh, with any bare fields out there. We could potentially see some, um, you know, the, the corn stalks are fairly weak from the drought this summer. They're already falling in places with little wind. And then we combine on 35, 40 mile an hour gusts. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that fall. And then lastly, we're going to see some fire weather concerns. We haven't had fire weather concerns for a while now because we, we were lacking that wind. But now that we throw that wind in there, definitely on elevated fire danger into early next week with uh, some increased fire potential or fire behavior as well. Absolutely. Yeah, something to be mindful of for sure and something to be keeping on our minds as we enter into the fall. And like you mentioned, these winds pick up. But Chip, thank you so much for this update. We really do appreciate it. Yep. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Once again, that was Chip Redman. He is our K-State meteorologist for this week's agricultural weather update. That concludes today's programming. We'll be back with more next week on Agriculture Today.